Hello, everyone. Welcome to week two of our Teak member education. Excited to be back with you today. Uh, we are going to talk about Teak history and Teak tradition, something that's uh, relevant and important to all of us. And I'm excited to, uh, to get moving here. So a uh, quick introduction again for those who did not watch last week's videos. My name is Alex Swinson. I'm the Director of Education for Talk Kappa Epsilon. And, and we're doing these videos and we put this program together because we recognize at headquarters that a lot of you had your new member education periods cut short. You may have been two weeks, four weeks, six weeks in. Um, you may not have started, but at the end of the day, these videos are, are really meant to supplement what you've already done in your chapters. Hopefully they can serve as a refresh for some of the things that you've already learned and covered, but also we want them to provide some new information, maybe a different perspective on things that, that you didn't get from your hegemon or, or from some of the other members in your chapter colony. And that's really where we wanted to come in and, and hopefully provide some help and provide some guidance. And, and it's not just TEAK education that we're talking about. Last week's videos covered uh, study habits, mental health, closing out the semester. This week, our, our second video covers financial literacy, saving, investing, budgeting. Um, so trying to touch on some different topics that are going to be relevant to everyone and, and not just new members, not just guys that have joined the fraternity in the last month or two, uh, anyone that has been a part of Teak for a year, three years, 40 years. Uh, again, hopefully this information is, is relevant and helpful. So uh, this meeting, again, we're gonna touch on Teak history and Teak traditions. That's chapters three and four of the Teak guide. If you have your Teak guide, I would encourage you to follow along uh, and check those chapters out to help put what we're talking about into focus. If you don't have a Teak guide or if your Teak guide's old or outdated or you've lost it, heaven forbid, um, you can go to tke.org slash guides and the Teak guide is available there. We're going to frame some of this not just as a, as a lecture, as you know, here's what happened 125 years ago. We want to we wanna talk about how it relates to us today and some of the lessons that we can take away. We're going to bring in a past Grand Preakness, Mark Roaming, a, a good friend of mine and a good friend of the fraternity, someone who has seen more in Teak than many people who have lived than, than many of our members ever have. We're going to ask him for his thoughts on our history and on our founding and, and what we can learn from, from what our founders did and what some of the early teaks did. I really want to emphasize your own personal reading and reflection this week though. These two chapters are pretty long, especially chapter three. I'm not gonna cover all of it. It would take me three hours to walk through the entire thing. I wanna focus on the highlights. I really wanna dig into the first 10, 20 years of our founding because I think those years were vital to A, the growth of Tall Kappa Epsilon across the United States, and B, vital to who we are today. Again, our values, what we preach, what we practice, uh, that was really all formed in, in the beginning, in the, in the genesis of our fraternity. So um, that's where I'm going to focus my time, but I really want you to go back and read these things. Again, whether you're a new member and you've never read them before, or whether you have maybe read it 20 times or you read it once, 25 years ago and, and haven't even thought about it since. Um, that's, that's really what I did while I was going through and <clears throat> preparing this was, <clears throat> excuse me, was go back through and, and read about our history again. And, and I picked up some things that frankly, I, I didn't know that I had no idea about. And, and it kind of, again, shaped and formed my perspective in a different way. It's very beneficial for me as someone who works on our staff and addresses a lot of this stuff on a daily or weekly basis. I think it'll be really beneficial to you as well. Let me grab a drink here, sorry. Oh, hopefully that helps. <clears throat> so I wanna, I wanna dive right in here. I wanna get started. January 10th, 1899. Most of us, if not all of us, probably have that date committed to memory. Bloomington, Illinois. Um, it's kind of in the east central part of the state of Illinois, not a thriving metropolis by any means. Um, not Bloomington, Indiana, where Indiana University is. It is uh, a separate city for those unfamiliar with the Midwest. At Illinois Wesleyan University, our five founders, Joseph Settle, C. Roy Atkinson, Claret, uh, Clarence Mayer, James McNutt and Owen Truett, they founded the Knights of Classic Lore. This was a group that was meant to be different than other fraternities on our campus. Our founders really 
didn't care for the other fraternities that were available to them. They didn't care for the, the members. They, uh, one of the quotes, I think, in the TCAT, I'm going to read you here, they, they had little regard for the usual snobbery or disdain for those outside of the fraternity, those who, uh, and they were talking about individuals in a fraternity who looked at those outside of that fraternity with, with disdain. They went around and, and thought about joining some of the other fraternities on campus and ultimately decided these are not people that we want to associate with. These are not people that we want to be a part of. And I, I think that's the first lesson. I think a lot of us have probably been in that situation in our T career when we were being recruited or looking around campus and, and some of these other fraternities that maybe are a little older, maybe have a little uh, more tradition. Uh, but but frankly, the, the members just stuck up their nose at those outside of the fraternity and, and told them to fly a kite. If, if you didn't look like them or talk like them or act like them, um, they don't want any part of you. And, and that's what our founders found. And that's why they decided to, uh, to form the Knights of Classic Lore, again, rooted in personal worth and character. We love to recite that line, um, not for wealth, rank, or honor, but, but personal worth and character, because they wanted to, to start a group that brought the best men in, regardless of your background, regardless of your religion, regardless of, of how much money you had. And that's not something that they were able to find on their campus. And, and I hope that you draw some inspiration from that right off the bat, from what those five men uh, were striving toward and, and looking to become. As a lot of us know, they did actually try and get their group into Phi Delta Theta. Uh, there was not a Phi Delta Theta chapter on the Illinois, Illinois Wesleyan campus. And much like we have interest groups and colonies that become teak chapters, they wanted to become a part of Phi Delta Theta. They petitioned in 1902 to join Phi Delta Theta. They were told no. Um, at that point, they changed their name to Tall Kappa Epsilon. And if you don't know right now why they chose those letters, you will find that out later on in, in your initiation ceremony. Um, but that's when the, the name was changed from the Knights of Classic Lore to, to Tall Kappa Epsilon. They thought that would make them a little more appealing to an already existing fraternity to have a, a Greek letter organization um, coming in. They tried two more times, um, 1904 and 1906. Both of those petitions were rejected, postponed, delayed. Um, they didn't get it. So in 1907, we get to the opportunity out of defeat with, with Frater Wallace McCauley. And the interesting thing about, um, about that is the opportunity out of defeat speech took place at a banquet at a gathering that was intended to build momentum and gather interest for a fourth petition to Phi Delta Theta. They all got to, they didn't all get together to, to form their own fraternity. Everyone was in the same place to try and come up with a new strategy to get into Phi Delta Theta. And Wallace McCauley, who was act, actually one of the most active proponents of joining Phi Delta Theta stood up and said, we're done with this. You know, we're, we're, we have tried so hard and they keep turning us down. There's a, there's a message in there. There's a lesson in there. Um, again, one of the things that, that Frater Macaulay said was Tall Kappa Epsilon was conceived in the early struggles of our existence. And I think by that, he meant that the, the failures, the disappointments, that's what made Teak who it was at that point, which again, in 1907 was just one chapter with, with a handful of members, but the early struggles, the early failures, that's what brought everyone together and, and formed that bond. And that's the wave of momentum that they were going to ride in, into becoming their own fraternity. So again, the opportunity out of defeat, Frater Rome is gonna talk a little bit about it later, but so important to our founding, but also so important to who we are, I think, as individuals and, and as a fraternity and, and the underlying lessons that are involved there. And I would encourage you to think about that a little bit and reflect on it and what it means to you and, and what it means to your chapter and who Teak is today. So we get to our first conclave then in 1909, two years after the opportunity out of defeat, there was a national board elected, which I think gave Teak a little more legitimacy. Uh, ritual was revised to be a standalone um, standalone piece that, that was not meant to be a part of another fraternity's ritual. Uh, and then we started growing. So in 1909, the beta chapter was formed. 1912, the gamma chapter, you can see the um, the institutions there where, where those chapters were brought in, the Delta chapter in 1912 as well. And then we get to 1915. And the importance of the Epsilon chapter um, was really twofold. One, 
having a fifth chapter gave us access to the NIC, which we talked about in our, our first video last week. But that, again, helped to build our legitimacy and, and give us some power as a, at that point, a national fraternity, that fifth chapter. But secondarily, a lot of the founders, remember, these are all members of the Alpha chapter that are going around the state of Illinois, talking to their friends, talking to people about becoming Teak. A lot of those members were against leaving the state of Illinois. They wanted to keep it close. They wanted to keep it local. Um, you know, interstate travel was not as common back in the early 1900s. Getting into Iowa, getting to the Epsilon chapter, who's still one of our, our top functioning chapters today, really uh, led to a, a, a shift in mindset for what TEAT could become. And it took the faith of a few individuals. It took the persistence of a few guys to, to push that change. And it just goes back to uh, some of the things we've already talked about, thinking a little differently, changing mindset. And, uh, and, and that's what allowed Teak to really blossom. And in the next two years, we added five more chapters. So think about that. It took us, what, 16 years to get five chapters. It took us 18 years to get to 10. That push outside of Illinois was huge. Um, and we just continued to grow and expand from there. So we'll move forward here into the, the next years of Teak. World War I obviously hit in the, the late 1910s, and uh, that was a challenge for a lot of fraternities, but Teak at that time restored all of our chapters to complete activity following the war. We did not lose any chapters, um, even with guys going away to, to fight overseas and, and all the issues that World War I caused here in the United States. Teak restored full activity, and that was really remarkable for such a young fraternity that frankly lacked structure at that time, may have lacked a clear vision, may have lacked a, a lot of leadership to come back and bounce back completely from more of the war one was huge. And then, then in 1921, we established our first headquarters. Um, Frater Tex Flint, his home served as our first uh, headquarters building in Lombard, Illinois. Um, he at that point was the retiring Grand Preetness of the fraternity and became the first executive vice president, which we know today as the CEO role. Um, so that was that was really Frater Flint making that decision to establish the headquarters building, even though it was just his house, um, take on the role of executive vice president and start looking more at the day-to-day -day operations, the business side of the fraternity that allows us all to, to be Teaks today. Uh, then during the Great Depression, um, we added, uh, added eight new chapters between 1930 and 1935. That was right after our 25th anniversary where um, Leland F. Leland, another uh, famous name in Teak, became Grand Histor. He held that post for 25 years. So that's, you know, the significance there of our 25th anniversary. And then the Depression, once again, a lot of fraternities were folding. They were facing struggles. They were facing issues. Um, Teak grew. And, and Teak became even stronger at that point due to the faith of those in charge and the faith of those who were, were leading our path forward. We get then to World War II, um, and, and World War II brought on some very new, unique challenges for the fraternity. This was really, for us, the, the first time that, that things went south, for lack of a better term. We had to cut expenses down to the bare bones. We had to, um, you know, stop paying a lot of the, the bills and the, the, normal, the normal things that allowed us to, to function as Tall Kappa Epsilon. And there was a decision made by the Grand Council at that point as to whether they wanted to try and push through and, and get through World War II as though nothing was happening, or whether they wanted to, to retreat, essentially, and prepare for expansion after the war. And that's the, the path that they chose. They did pull back a little bit. They pulled back chapter operations. Um, we were down to 11 chapters in 1944 uh, when the war was starting to, to wrap up. That was, a, that was a cognizant decision that was made by our leaders to, to really focus on what's going to happen next. The Teak Loyalty Fund, this was really the first time that we had gone out and asked for money from our alumni. We asked every alumnus to donate $3 to help their fraternity thrive and help the fraternity continue to function. And we raised $30,000 from that. And that was a huge, huge benefit when it came to building back up after the war. The photo there is, is of R.C. Williams. And R.C. Williams is, is one of the most significant figures, I think, in the history of Tall Cap Epsilon because he became 
Graham Preetness in 1944 when we had 11 chapters and people were telling him that we needed to fold, we needed to close up shop, um, we needed to just cut ties with everyone and, and start from the beginning. And Frater Williams, who was actually a, a rear admiral um, in, the, in the military and, and served our country, he said no. He believed that, that if we started with the base that was in existence, Teak would build its way back up and Teak would bounce back. And that Teak Loyalty Fund allowed us to hire field supervisors, which you know today as regional directors and associate regional directors, guys who are being paid to go around the country and build chapters and, and build relationships and help the fraternity grow. And, and that happened under Frater Williams. By 1949, our Golden Jubilee, our 50th anniversary, we had all but four chapters reactivated from the pre-war years and 28 new chapters have been installed. We had 70 chapters at that point and over 3,000 members. So in, in the five years between 1944 and 1949, we went from 11 active chapters to 70. Once again, our ability to be resilient, our ability to bounce back from adversity that, that really started with our founders and rode us all the way through the end of World War II and, and continues on today. And that's why, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the chapter three of the Teak Guide is focused on World War II because of what it meant to our fraternity and what R.C. Williams did for Talk Kappa Epsilon. Want to run through some other significant pieces here. And again, each one of these bullet points has paragraphs written in the Teak Guide that I would encourage you to go read, but um, I, you know, I don't want to, don't want to keep you here for hours on end. So March, 19, March of 1957, we established our Canadian Alpha chapter. And Frater Bruce Melcher, who became a very important figure to talk about Epsilon and still is today, he was the leader in expanding to Canada. And that's what made us an international fraternity, something that we're very proud of still um, here in, in 2020. Bruce Melcher was, was really the first person to say, hey, let's get out of the U.S. Let's go north of the border and, and allow other members or other individuals to be part of this fraternity that aren't U.S. citizens. So um, Frater Bruce would go on to serve as, as CEO or executive vice president for a, a long term. He would go on to serve as Grand Preetness. And um, for those that, that know Bruce, you know, he's still very involved in the fraternity today and, and lives here in Indianapolis, swings by headquarters from time to time. Um, but thinking back to 1957, uh, over 50 years ago, he, he was one of the most important figures in, in our fraternity's history. The TKE Scholarship Fund in 1963 um, merged with the fraternity to form the TKE Educational Foundation, which today is known as the Teak Foundation. And um, they started to pick up steam in the 60s, raising money, asking alumni to donate and give back and helping to create that culture of giving that I know we all appreciate as Teaks. At our 33rd conclave, that was in 1965, um, that's when we really that's when we really created the board of directors concept with the Grand Council. And, and that allowed the, the modern staff structure to take over a little bit where the board of directors was overseeing operations, making high level decisions, but the staff were the ones that were going and executing and, and making sure that those decisions were being adhered to and followed and, and executed at a high level. So that was back in 1965. Um, 1972 and 73, our headquarters was established in Indianapolis. So that's when we moved to Indy in the early 70s. And TJ Schmitz was installed as executive vice president. TJ served uh, another very, very long term, over 25 years as executive vice president, was a very important individual and, and really the modern structure of what our staff is today and what we do uh, at the offices of the Grand Chapter. In 1984, uh, Frater Reagan was president. He was in the White House, and there was a reception hosted at the White House for Teaks. And I think that's that's really incredible. That's something that I don't think a lot of fraternities have had the opportunity to experience. And Ronald Reagan was not just probably our most famous alumnus. He was also extremely involved. He gave back to the fraternity. He made sure that Teak was always on his mind. And, and we'll talk about distinguished alumni here in a second. That's not something you get with many high level alumni to have the president of the United States in that position where Tall Cap Epsilon influenced him and, and made such a big impact on his life and he wanted to give back is, is really remarkable. And, and at that reception, Frater Reagan was awarded the Order of the Golden Eagle Award, which is the highest award that we give out to, uh, to any member. And he was also awarded the NIC Gold Medal, which is the highest award that any fraternity man can receive. 
the 90s, we hit some speed bumps. Um, we, we shrunk a little bit. We were forced to pull back operations. Um, and that was a tough time for the fraternity. We had two different uh, executive vice presidents in that stretch, Frater Timothy Murphy, who a lot of you know as Murph, um, and William Metzger, both spent time in the, the EVP role. And then by 1999, our Centennial Conclave, which took place in Indianapolis, Teak was back in a position of strength, back in a position of power. The finances were in a better position. Our membership was in a better position. Um, once again, knowing that we, we hit those rough spots, we hit those rough patches and bounce back as we always do and as we always have. 1999, Kevin Mayhew took over as CEO um, and he served uh, a very long term in that position as well, uh, a little over 10 years. We look to the 2000s um, and the continued growth that the fraternity saw. We continued to add chapters. That's when we really, really emphasized the importance of our alumni, our volunteers, of the Grand Province Advisors, the Province Advisors, the Chapter Advisors. That big push was made during the 2000s under the leadership of Frater Mayu. Um, regional leadership conferences really took on the shape that you see today and, and the importance of TEAK programming took off even further. In the 2000s, um, I was initiated in 2009, very important milestone there. Um, and also we added our 250,000th lifetime member who was Frater Steve Forbes. He was initiated at Conclave in New Orleans in 2009. And, and you know, to have such a notable name as our, our 250,000th member was important then. And I think it's important now. Um, moving then to, to the 2010s, uh, we moved our headquarters building. We moved it from 8645 Founders Road to 7439 Woodland Drive on the north side of Indianapolis. Um, it's where I work. It's where I go in every day when I'm not stuck at home because of the coronavirus. So um, that happened in, in the early 2010s. Uh, we had three different stints with uh, with the CEO, Sean Babine, Steve Ramos, and, and Donnie Aldrich, who took over in 2014 and is fortunately still leading our organization today. Um, and really, the, the 2010s led to a very much increased online presence for Talk App Absalon. Our, our member module took the shape that it, that it has today that many of you utilize. You know, things like the online education that you're taking part in right now, that became available as, as more resources and more technology became available to everyone. Teak made sure to take full advantage. Our my.tke.org module was created. Um, a lot of good technological advances were made in the last 10 years. And then obviously uh, the 2020s that are, that are really just getting started in pretty unique circumstances, but um, I'm sure you know the next 10 years will write its own chapter in the Teak Guide that you know, maybe these videos will still be alive then and, and you can all go back and read about. Quickly want to touch on distinguished alumni, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, I put a lot of photos up there, tried to try to get a good mix of business leaders, athletes, Aaron Rodgers, the big show, uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, Howard Schultz, who um, serves as the served as the CEO of Starbucks, obviously Bob Barr, who ran for president of the United States and was a U.S. congressman. Um, you can also check out his appearance in Borat. Uh, Bob, if you're watching this, sorry about that. Um, Steve Forbes, who I mentioned earlier, Ronald Reagan, Terry Bradshaw, Jim Crane of the Houston Astros, the owner of the Astros. You may have seen him uh, in the news or on SportsCenter recently, but um, we have many more distinguished alumni just like this. A uh, hundred names that I could probably rattle off. Just know this, Teak has tons of alumni that are, are very successful in their own fields. Um, some are still engaged, some unfortunately are not, but at the end of the day, uh, I think having these alumni and having these important people as a part of our history is is extremely valuable and hopefully you take some pride in being able to to wear the same badge and, and having gone through the same ritual that a lot of these men did uh i want to jump now uh and, and this is something that we've done at the end of some of the other videos we're going to do it in the middle here um another one of our very distinguished alumni i'll move myself there frauder mark roaming past grand Preetness. um frauder mark lives down in new orleans he is the uh, president and ceo of the new orleans tourism and marketing corporation i think is correct if i if i butcher that i apologize mark um Frater Mark served as Grand Preetness from 2003 to 2005. He stayed very, very involved in the fraternity since then. Um, and again, he has perspectives on some of this history stuff that not a lot of other people do based on his time that he spent with Teak, with the fraternity. Um, he spent a lot of time with our Leadership Academy. He still attends conclaves, RLCs. Um, and I just wanted to bring him in to, to share a little more 
perspective. And welcome in to Frater Mark Romig, past Grand Preetness of Talk Kappa Epsilon. Frater Mark, how are things in New Orleans? Well, you know, Frater, uh, I would say that we're about the same as the rest of the nation right now as we uh, all work through this new norm. Um, the city, uh, which depends greatly on tourism, uh, has been affected um, tremendously from a standpoint of the economy. Uh, about 50% of the city's revenue is derived from our hospitality right. industry. And so uh, you can imagine what that has done and what the, what the outlook looks like. Now we are, with our organization, we're the, the CVB for the city, uh, New Orleans and company. We're all in this planning mode now for the relaunch because we will all get through this. At some point, we will see the other side and we need to be ready to stand up the restaurants, the hotels, the attractions. Yeah. And so that's our, that's our focus right now. Yeah, absolutely. I, hopefully things are uh, start to get back to normal as this, we get through the summer and people return to Bourbon Street, although I think uh, Bourbon Street probably has its own, uh, its own allure that people will, uh, will want to be a part of when the time comes. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to be looking at a whole different way of approaching uh, large events, festivals, yeah. sporting events, uh, definitely Bourbon Street. Uh, important thing is that we want everyone to be uh, safe and follow the guidelines that are given to us by the CDC and our federal officials and our state officials. So uh, we've got a lot of smart people that are thinking through this and I think, I think we'll be fine. Good, good deal. Well, I know uh, what, what we've talked about and, and what we're talking about here today is, is really a focus on teak history and where the fraternity has come from and where it's been and where it's going. To frame some of that, will you just share a little bit about your Teak experience and, and all that you accomplished and have accomplished as a member of Talk Cap Epsilon? I'd love to do that. Uh, my experience started back in uh, 1974 at the University of New Orleans. I was uh, rushed into uh, the Theta Mu chapter of Talk Cap Epsilon at the University of New Orleans. And I went in that direction, and it was interesting because a lot of my high school buddies were moving into another direction and going with another fraternity. But I really wanted something uh, different than what uh, what the fraternity scene looked like at that time. Uh, and it, and the, the words of uh, of TKE spoke to me, and it was uh, the decision that I look back on now, and and it it really made a change in my entire life. And and so started there, worked my way through the chapter. Uh, various committees, officers. I was, uh, I was Preetness for my uh, junior year uh, and then um, experienced Conclave for the first time in 1977. It was in New Orleans, uh, which was a, a great experience as all Conclaves are. And then uh, graduated and started working and uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought I might be a chapter advisor or at one time even thought about going on the road and being a professional staff member. But I got pulled in a different direction in my career and really did not re-engage again uh, in the fraternity until um, the late 80s. Uh, the fraternity was coming back to New Orleans for a conclave and uh, that was going to be in 1991. And, and that then executive director T.J. Schmitz approached me and asked me to be involved on the local host committee. And it started from there. And then I uh, was elected to the Grand Council at that um, conclave and worked my uh, way through uh, volunteer roles on the council, uh, early leadership academy back in the 90s, uh, and then uh, ultimately uh, served as Grand Preakness uh, for the 2003-2005 biennium. Um, and that was uh, a very exciting time as well. Excellent. Well, uh, if, if Joining Teak staff is still on your bucket list. I can make a few calls for you. Um, we can, uh, can I get we, a reference? That's, I would need a reference, I think. And, and if absolutely. you've got something for uh, members of AARP that have a special discount for rent or something, I could take advantage of that. We could save a lot of, a lot of money on uh, hotels, I think, if you join the traveling staff, getting those, uh, those big discounts. Yeah, and I don't <laughs> eat much anymore either. You know. <laughs> Um, you talked about your time on the Grand Council and, and getting back involved with the fraternity. Really, what was it that drove your desire to get involved with Teak in a larger capacity, join the Grand Council, serve as Grand Preetness? And, and even since your term as Grand Preetness, uh, you, you have not gone anywhere. You've stayed very engaged, very involved. Why, why did you choose to do that as an alumnus? 
You know, I have to say, because I couldn't say no, TJ Schmitz asked me to re-engage and to be involved in Conclave um, back in the late 80s as the 91 Conclave was being planned and uh, uh, saw an opportunity to to want to be something other than just a, just a, uh, giving uh, my time. Uh, I really wanted to get into it in a big way. And so I threw my name in the hat, my hat in the ring, I should say, for a position on the on our board of directors of the Grand Council, and um, just started from there. I have to tell you though, my my true passion uh, was found at Leadership Academy and serving as a small group leader, as a as a um, presenter, uh, and watching that uh, ability that we've given so many young men to take some time away from their summer, uh, devoted to their own leadership development skills and see a lot of people grow in so many fantastic ways. And so uh, that's been my true passion. And I talk about the Leadership Academy as being the thing that really kept my, my fire uh, lit and um, being able to see some results from that. I, I continued through the Grand Council as we discussed, uh, but it was always the joy of going back into the Leadership Academy mode uh, and to be part of uh, some transformational times in people's lives. And, that's where, as you know, I continue to uh, uh, to want to participate. Uh, I commend you for what you've been able to do uh, as far as the as the the organizer of such a great week. You're, you're, you've got a great style with the young men um, and you and your entire team, uh, Chris Niles, of course, and the fact that the uh, Charles Walgreen took his largesse along with Elmer Smith and have been able to keep this alive so that we can now touch the lives of 70 plus men each and every year uh, to uh, to not only build themselves as better individuals, but to build better leaders for our nation. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and I appreciate that. And I know you've been a, a vital part of the, the program and the success of the program. And I think, you know, you're not alone in that that a lot of the individuals who experience Leadership Academy, either as a participant or a facilitator or a guest speaker, feel a very close tie to the program. And, and you know, that's obviously not the intention of, of this call necessarily, but hopefully those that are that are watching take stock in that and look to apply and get involved in it in some capacity. It certainly is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. I want to uh, to talk a little more about what we've discussed already a little bit in, in this workshop, which is Teak history. We've covered some of the high points of the fraternity, some of the low points of the fraternity, the founding, where we've come from. When you think about Teak history, what what do you believe to be one or two of the more interesting pieces of our history as a fraternity? And which parts do you believe are, are the most vital to our success or have been the most vital throughout the time that we've been in existence? Well, I think there are two periods and they're, they're, they're close to each other in time and, and, the, and the time distance. Um, one was, of course, just the, the original coming together of the, of the five men um, to create something different than what they saw on the, cha on the, uh, on the campus. Uh, they wanted to create a chapter of, uh, of young men that didn't follow the normal routine of what they saw out there in the fraternity landscape. Uh, they wanted something more closely tied, uh, tied to academics, uh, the literary society approach, something that um, was not uh, elite uh, from the standpoint of uh, it was all about title or all about uh, who you were, uh, who is your parent or, or how much money you had. It was more about uh, the character of the individual. And so I think I think the fact that we we come from a stock of of men who believed in that, and I think that obviously we know that has followed through all of our history. Uh, so I think that just the original thought of why this organization should come together as the Knights of Classic Lore, and then I think through the next I think transformational point in our history was uh, the opportunity out of the feed speech that was given. You know, we were trying to do something with an existing fraternity. We were going to take our organization and fold it into this, the fourth largest fraternity at the time in the nation. And, uh, and, you know, we took a moment and we stepped back and I think it was the, the ghost of the founders coming together again, uh, or the, the memory of the founders coming together again and saying, you know, we have an opportunity to do something different. 
Uh, and we have an opportunity now to build on what we believe in and we can become our own organization. Uh, and uh, the letters TKE can, can stand forward uh, for generations to come. And I think that, again, shows through to our thinking as it stands today. You know, we are uh, a fraternity that's inclusive, not exclusive. We are a fraternity that is based on the character of the individual and not the bank account of the individual, so to speak. And I think uh, it all stems from this the original thought process of, of the men that created our organization as we know it today. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how many other time periods in our fraternity, the Depression and, and the two world wars, um, you know, those difficult times that really led Tall Cap Epsilon to regroup and, and come together and, and build back even stronger. Uh, to me, that's one of the more fascinating parts about our history as well and something that I think we as Teeks can, can hold dear and, and being unique and being different than some of the other organizations out there. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd be very proud of those times in our history that uh, instead of going along with the norm, uh, we challenged ourselves and we challenged the environment and said, we're going to do it differently and do it better. And, and I think our history has shown that we've made those right decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Another piece that I, I want to touch on is, you know, thinking about who we are as Teeks today and, and what the present looks like and what the future looks like. What is it? about our history, and uh, we just touched on a few of the things, what is it about our history that you look at as uh, different points or, or different ideals that are going to help us continue to build toward the future and, and become even greater than we already are? Well, I think that the fact that we have always uh, been a group that uh, is inclusive of thought, uh, that we're not afraid to tackle uh, the tough issues of the day, uh, we, we stand on our principles, uh, we act on our principles, uh, and we're always uh, in a communication and listening mode. It's not as if there's this ivory tower of the, out there of the Grand Council not, you know, um, hearing and listening to and, and remembering that we're there for one purpose only, and that is to build the next generation of, of teaks. Uh, it's not our fraternity, it's the next generation's fraternity, so to speak, and I think that throughout history has has given rise to the thought process that will see us into the next century and to, until we be, we can look back at, at our 200th anniversary and, and say, again, um, we've been great stewards of the past and that has given us the chance to have a future. Uh, so I, I think that that sort of wraps up to me what what the history has has provided us. It's, it's the roadmap to to make the right decisions going forward because we've never based ourselves on the material as much as the spiritual. Uh, and I think that falls through as we sit in our ritual and we discuss this, what makes us as uh, the, a very special fraternity of men founded on those, those uh, core principles. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And uh, I agree. I agree completely. That was really the, the last question I had for you as far as history goes and, and, you know, everything, again, that, that's being touched upon in this workshop. But is there any anything final that you'd like to share, Fraud or Mark, with uh, whether it's a new member, whether it's a, an existing member or an alumnus, but someone watching this video that's that's looking for something to take away as a member of T? Thanks. That's a great question. And I, uh, I have been thinking through um, what uh, we all should try to remember uh, as we become members uh, and we experience our collegiate days as a member of Talk Cap Epsilon and, and that uh, you will have a lifetime of Talk Cap Epsilon. Uh, I would ask everyone to consider that once you graduate that you uh, remain involved. Uh, you may take the same road that I took and step away for a few years, but know that you are always a teak. Uh, it's funny, you know, you talk to some people and they say, oh, yes, I was a member of that chapter. or I was a member of that fraternity. And uh, it's always good to re remember that it really means that you are still a member of that chapter and you are still a member of that fraternity. Um, and, you know, the old adage, you only uh, take out what you what you can put in. And if you can put in a lot, you'll be taking out a lot as well. Um, just stay engaged. I can tell you I'm 64. I've been involved since I was uh, 18. Uh, and it has been uh, a fantastic road trip. Uh, it uh, continues to be uh, uh, 
to me, the most special part of my life. And uh, I wish that for everyone. Uh, and, you know, I love this fraternity. And an excellent message to end on. Certainly appreciate your time, brother Mark. Always good seeing you. Always good being able to talk and uh, appreciate what you've brought to this conversation. And hopefully those that are participating and watching can take your words and, and find a way to apply them to their own lives and their own learning and their own teaching experience. So with that, I'll let you go. Uh, appreciate it as always. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Alex. Uh, stay safe and uh, hope to see you at Leadership Academy this summer. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. So moving now to chapter four of the TCAT. And again, I'll, I'll try and get through some of this quickly, uh, knowing that you are able to go back and read about it. A lot of it you might already know. The TIC symbols and the TIC traditions. These are um, some of the big things that make us what we are, our membership badge. There's a photo of it there. Um, it's important that you know how to wear the membership badge. And that is over the heart on the left side, never on a jacket, never on a pocket. You can wear it on a, a, a collared shirt or a sweater, um, but never on a, a sport coat or a suit jacket or anything like that. Don't put it on your pocket. Over the heart, uh, pointed in the same way that our that our founding triangle is pointed. We talked about the triangle in the first video, the significance of, of the three chapters. Um, the best way to think of that is either to line up the, um, line up the right side of the badge with your, with your buttons on your shirt or point the tip of the badge down at your belt buckle. So that is, you know, when you're putting your badge on, it is meant to be worn a little bit crooked. It's not meant to be worn sideways where the tip is pointed across your chest. Um, Perpendicular to the ground is, is really what the T-Guide says, but there's a hundred different ways to think about it. I think of the belt buckle method. Uh, it just helps me. White or Roman gold is what the badge is, is, is comprised of um, with the three white pearls on the uh, corners of the triangle. Our coat of arms, which uh, is shown there as well. We had four different versions of the coat of arms and, and a lot of different people took a stab at creating one. What we see today was created in 1926. Um, and there's a lot of symbolism in that. It, there, there are no accidents in our coat of arms and either you've learned about that through secret works and through initiation or you will, so I won't spoil it for you. But um, the coat of arms does have a lot of meaning and, and does have a lot of importance to our fraternity. And I hope that uh, if you don't know what that is, you take the time to learn. The teak flag shown there, uh, and that is how it is meant to be displayed. The five triangles pointed up at the, uh, the, the top of the flag post, I guess, is, is the best way to describe it. It's not, you know, meant to be flown diagonally or in reverse or backwards. You can hang it vertically as well, which, which there's a photo there showing that, but same deal with the orientation of the triangles. Um, the five triangles are, all have meaning that, once again, you'll learn about a little later, meant to resemble what is on our coat of arms. But uh, most important thing with the flag is that you're hanging it and displaying it correctly, going from the bottom right to the top left. Um, we talk about Apollo as our Greek god and, and why Apollo. These, uh, these are decisions that were made by our founders, by our early members. Apollo is the Greek god of light and the Greek god of truth. And he held the ideals that our founders thought all members should strive towards. So I would encourage you to read more about Apollo, both in our T guide and in general. Go to Wikipedia, do some research on your own and, and learn about Apollo and why he's important to our fraternity. The Teak Magazine, very important piece of Talk Up Epsilon as well. It is published quarterly. It is the official educational journal of Talk Up Epsilon. Every member um, receives a copy of the Teak Guide, and then you can re uh, continue receiving that once you graduate by donating to the Teak Foundation or joining Life Loyal Teak. And, and really, that's one of the best ways to stay engaged and stay apprised of, of what's going on in our fraternity. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, and then lastly, Founders Day, and that is displayed correctly. So make sure you have the apostrophe in the correct spot. Founders Day, of course, is January 10th, which we talked about at the very, very beginning, um, why that is. And Founders Day is really meant to be a time to reflect on our founding, reflect on what Teak means, gather as, as members, maybe see guys you haven't seen in a while. It is our official day of celebration. I wish that it was at a little warmer time of year, but uh, that's when our founders felt it necessary to, to create the Knights of Classic lore. Uh, nothing we can do about that. And uh, hopefully you're, you're able as, as Founders Day, you know, 
comes and goes to find ways to keep guys involved and engaged and get them excited and, and have gatherings and, and celebrate our fraternity with all of with all of your brothers. The last big piece to touch on here is uh, is the Declaration of Principles, and that was crafted by William Wilson in 1907, right around the same time that we made the decision to become our own fraternity. The the Declaration of Principles outlines the basic values, the basic beliefs, the core of who we are as Tall Cap Epsilon. A lot of you know the ninth paragraph. In, entrenched in that ninth paragraph is charity, esteem, and love. And we spent a lot of time on that in, in our first video, so I'm not going to recap all that. Hopefully you go back and, and watch video 1.1 1 .1, um, from last week. But charity, esteem, and love, that's that was created in the Declaration of Principles. And, and really what that document did was it illustrated the importance of who we are as, as teaks, who we should be as individuals, as members of the fraternity. It talked about the non-exclusiveness that our founders had such disdain for. Don't, don't turn up your nose at, at people who aren't members of the fraternity. Include them, welcome them, make them feel appreciated. Even if they don't decide to join teak, that's okay. You can still treat them as quality individuals. Having that respect, conducting ourselves as gentlemen, and having the character that reflects well on our fraternity. That's really where the, the idea that you're always wearing your letters came from. When you join Talk Up Epsilon, you are now a representative for every single person who has ever joined the fraternity. That's outlined in the Declaration of Principles, and we say it today again as you're always wearing your letters. But that belief, that idea was, was really founded by William Wilson in 1907. And that's why the, the DOP is so important to our, our founding and to our history and to our future. I would really encourage you to go read it. Um, it's a quick read. It'll take you about five minutes. The full thing is contained within chapter four of the Teak Guide. So hopefully you're reading that already. But um, the Declaration of Principles is, is as important as anything that's happened since 1899 in Tall Cap Epsilon. And, and those are a few reasons exactly why. That is all that, that I really have to share on our history and our traditions. I really want to emphasize one more time the importance of going back and doing some reading and research on your own. I got through this quickly, uh, as quickly as I could, but there is a lot more that you can go read about and learn about with the history of our fraternity, with uh, some of the years that I skipped, some of the big gaps that I didn't talk about. It's all in the tea guide, and you can find out, you know, what happened in the 70s and why that's important, and what happened in the the 19... 90s and and you know exactly how the fraternity bounced back from the tough times that it had been in um please go do that because we all need that refresher from time to time and if you're just joining talk Cap epsilon framing your understanding of what our fraternity is is going to be extremely important as you go through your time as a member um we talked last week about building an education journal finding a place to write down your thoughts and ideas what are your major takeaways of chapters three and four why are those chapters important to you? Why are those chapters important to your chapter? Why are our chapters three and four important to your campus, to your community, to the fraternity as a whole? Write some of that down. That's the best way to capture your feelings and your beliefs in real time and ensure that that information is not going to a waste. Also last week, I challenged you to create a virtual brotherhood event. Find a way to keep members engaged, not in person. And I hope you did that. And if you hadn't, um, I hope you do. I want to issue another challenge this week, which is find a way to put together a virtual service event. There are plenty of ways, and you can do a lot of research on this. You can Google it um, pretty quickly. How to, how to make your community better from your home. A lot of people need assistance right now. A lot of people need guidance. A lot of people have lost their jobs and, and don't have a steady source of income, and, and that creates a lot of issues. We as TEKS can take a big role in helping to alleviate some of that pressure and some of that pain. And I want to challenge you, if you're watching this, either as a new member, as a current member, as an alumnus, to find a way to make the world a better place in the next week. You don't have to do it, but put the wheels in motion. Start the plans. That could be an online St. Jude event. I know as I record this, the men at Virginia Tech have raised over $150,000 in the last week for St. Jude. Online. Completely online. And that's huge. You don't have to raise $150,000 for St. Jude. I would love it if you did. You could raise $1,000, but do something. Get, it'll help change your mindset. I think it'll make you feel a little better. And, uh, and it gives you another opportunity to connect with other men in your chapter, other men in your pledge class, and, and build towards something bigger 
than yourself. And then our next lesson, um, which will be released this week also, is about financial well-being, financial management, how you're, how you're budgeting and saving and spending. We're going to have a, a guest speaker there, someone who um, is a, a, in wealth management and can talk a little more about some, some complicated investment terms that maybe a lot of us aren't familiar with and building a budget and, and saving money. So I hope you take that in as well. But for now, that is all I have. Thank you all for participating and watching, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all again very soon.